Okay. All right. Oh, get some echo. Got it? Echo, echo. Echo, echo, echo. Okay. Uh, test, test, test. Did it go away? Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, my name is Joshua Watt, and I'm going to talk to you today about the software, bill of materials, and the supply chain with the ARC project. A little bit about myself. I've been working at Garmin as, as an embedded software engineer since 2009. And we've been using Open Embedded in the Octa project since 2016 to make embedded Linux products. I'm a member of the Open Embedded Technical Steering Committee, and there's all the various ways you can contact me if you would like to do that. All right, so if you are unfamiliar with the Octa project and Open Embedded, Open Embedded is a community-driven project that provides the Open Embedded core layer and BitBake, which is the build system used to be build primarily embedded systems, but all sorts of other things, as I'll talk about. The Octa project is a Linux foundation project that maintains the Pocky reference distribution and also provides the auto builder hardware used to run a whole bunch of QA tests to ensure that the project is high quality. Uh, they also manage the release schedule, provide funding for personnel, and uh, provide a lot of excellent documentation for the project, which is awesome. I really like our documentation. You should go check it out. So here's a brief outline. I have a lot of slides, so I'm not going to stop here. All right. <laughs> so what is the software supply chain, and why do I need one? Um, so the software supply chain is really about answering what's in the software that we're shipping. So we ship a binary to someone or use it ourselves. We really want to know what's in that thing that we're using. So we want to know basic questions like, where did the software come from? What version is it? If we have licenses, we need to know if we're complying with those licenses, be it GPL uh, requirements or attribution requirements or things like that. We also want to know if that software has been tampered with, either maliciously or unintentionally. Uh, because we don't want to expose ourselves or our customers to uh, you know, unnecessary uh, risks by having tampered software. And the same thing with exploits. Like if, if our software is vulnerable to exploits, we want to know that to protect ourselves and our customers. Ultimately, the software supply chain tries to answer the question, can the deliverables that we're shipping be traced back to the code that generated them? So at its core, that's sort of the intent of the software supply chain. So I'm going to talk about the Open Embedded build flow, which is how Open Embedded builds software, and uh, how it, the way that it builds software has an inherent software supply chain to it. So when people want to build stuff with Open Embedded, uh, they primarily start out with three things. They have the source code that they want to build, which comes from Git repositories or tarballs or whatever it is. They have some metadata that we call recipes, which describes how that source code should be built. And then we have various policy information, which is like, do I run or run systemd or sysv init, you know, various configuration bits and bobs that make your thing do whatever it's supposed to do. They feed all this into this magical tool called BitBake, and it spits out what we like to call a target image, uh, which can be a, a whole bunch of different things that I'll talk about in a minute. You take that target image, you put it on your widget, and you profit, right? It's great. And when we talk about a target image, uh, there's actually a whole bunch of things that we classify as a quote-unquote target image uh, that you might not normally think of as a target image. So we do have the traditional embedded, flash this on an SD card and boot it on a Raspberry Pi, like you can see up there at the top. Uh, and we can also generate uh, microcontroller firmware that you could flash onto a microcontroller for whatever reasons. Uh, but we can also generate a whole bunch of other stuff. So we can actually generate images that you could put onto a hard drive and boot up a full PC like uh, any other desktop Linux distro. And we can also generate uh, virtual machine images, uh, primarily QEMU, but I actually learned just this week that we can generate uh, virtual machine images that you can import as AMIs into AWS and run them there if you want to do that. Another lesser known thing that we can generate is uh, OCI compliant container images. So we can actually build container images that you can import into your favorite container runtime, be that Docker, Podman, Cryo, whatever the flavor is this week, uh, and run those. Uh, we can also generate package feeds for the various uh, package runtimes that we support, which uh, currently is IPK, Debian, and RPM. So uh, these allow you to publish package repositories just like you would for any desktop distribution. So if you've, say, flashed your image to your Raspberry Pi, you can then point it at the package repository that you've published and just install software using apt or DNF or whatever you would like a desktop distribution. 
There's also a whole bunch of internal things that we can generate. Uh, the SDK allows you to, uh, that is something you can ship to customers or use internally for yourself that allows you to compile software. It provides compilers and tools and things to compile software against a given image. So you could compile an executable, copy it onto whatever your target is, and then run that. We also have the extensible SDK, which is a more advanced version of the SDK that I really don't have time to go into. And uh, Build Tools Tarball, which is really cool for supply chain reasons, and I'll talk about that at the very end of my presentation. So digging into how the build flow works uh, that BitBake provides. So we start with a couple of different things. So over there on the far left, we've got the host tools. So these are the bare minimum set of tools that you need to build the project. This is going to be things like Python, because BitBake is written in Python. Uh, uh, Git and a uh, host compiler. So this is going to be the host GCC needed to compile stuff to run on your host. It does not need to be a cross compiler. We also have some source code uh, up along the top there. And we've got the recipe metadata that says how we're going to build that source code. So the first thing that BitBake is going to do is it's going to take these host tools and it's going to ingest some source code and process some recipe metadata and produce what we call the native tools and also the cross compiler. So we're actually building the cross compiler that we are going to use later on as part of the build step and we're also building what we call these native tools. So a good example of a native tool might be the Google protobuffer compiler. It's something that runs on your host that you use as part of a build to generate stuff that you need later on actually on target. Um, so, you know, you, you use the Google Protobuf compiler to compile Protobuf files to C code or C++ code or whatever it is. Using these native tools and cross compilers, we're then going to process yet more recipe metadata and ingest more source code, and this is going to produce the target packages. So these are the things that are targeted to run on whatever your final target architecture is, be it ARM or x86 or RISC-V or whatever. The final step that we do is we have yet more recipe metadata that says what target packages you want to install on your final target image. And so we've got a recipe that says install these packages on this image and produce the final thing. So the way that BitBake tracks when things need to be rebuilt is using a very sophisticated method of hashing. So the way that this works is all of the inputs to a given recipe are hashed together to produce a single final hash that we call the task hash. And then this hash is then used as the input to subsequent recipes and gets incorporated into their task hash. So you get this chain of hashes all the way through the system. And what this means is, uh, oh, and that hash includes all of the uh, inputs and all of the recipe metadata itself that is used during that particular build step. And so if any of that changes, that's going to change the hash. And that signals to BitBake that that thing needs to be rebuilt. And because that hash changes, then all of the downstream hashes from that will also change. And so BitBake knows it needs to rebuild all of the downstream stuff that depends on that. So just as an example, if the source code for the Google Protobuf compiler, for example, changes uh, because you bump the version or something like that, that's going to, invalid that's going to cause that hash of that source code to change. Uh, when that happens, all of these downstream hashes that are dependent on that are going to change. So BitBake will then know, oh, I need to rebuild the protobuf compiler. I need to rebuild all the uh, recipes that use the protobuf compiler. And then I finally need to rebuild the target image uh, at the end of the day. So because of this sophisticated method of hashing, uh, we actually have really good traceability, i.e. a really good software supply chain, back to all the things that went into your image because we can take from a target image and trace back through all these hashes to the individual components that went into it. And importantly, we can do this not only for the target packages, the actual cross-compiled things, but a significant portion of the native tools and cross-compilers because we're building them ourselves uh, as part of the entire build process. Basically everything but the host tools, we have very good uh, supply chain tracking on all of these things, just inherently due to the hashing mechanism that we use to track dependencies in general. All right, so the software bill of materials. So the way that I like to describe software bill of materials is it's the nutrition information for your software. Uh, 
you've been to any talk here, you've probably seen something like this already. Um, but basically, you know, we've seen these ingredient labels on food. They're a standardized way that we can quickly see what we're putting into our bodies, the basic ingredients that are in there, and then various information about it. And an SBOM is kind of the same thing. It's basically a standardized encoding uh, that allowed us to easily exchange information about what's in our software and know what's going on with it. Um, and so there's multiple different SBOM formats out there. There's uh, SPDX and Cyclone DX, and another one that I always forget because I can't remember, um, that might be used to describe the same actual software supply chain. So you can kind of think of the SBOM as sort of the way that you encode the information in whatever your software supply chain is. At least that's the way I like to think about it. So uh, the important stuff that's in an SBOM is what the software components that we have in our system and what are the relationships between them. Now, so this is a really popular graphic that's used around to describe this. And so it can show you the various properties of what's going on and how they're related. And I really like this graph because I think it fits really well with this graph. You can pretty easily imagine that, you know, we have a recipe that produces Carol's compression engine, and then that is then ingested by another recipe as a dependency that's Bob's browser, and you know, we're tracking all those dependencies and all that information just like that. So what stuff do we have in our recipes that we might want to include in an SBOM? Well, it turns out we actually have a lot of stuff. Uh, so our recipes are fairly comprehensive in how they describe software, so we have a lot of information we can include. We've got the stuff that you would expect to be there, so we've got the versions of the software that we're building. Uh, we have the source code URLs from when we downloaded it, which we have to have because we download it as part of the build process. Uh, we also have pretty advanced uh, license tracking that we do because for a long time the project has uh, had tools to help people do license compliance, either GPL compliance or whatever it is, just to know in general what licenses they have on the things they're producing. Uh, so we've had that for a long time. We also have all the build time dependencies, which we obviously have to have uh, in order to correctly build the software. So we know what all the build dependencies are. And similarly, the runtime dependencies. We have mechanisms for automatically determining some runtime dependencies, um, and, or we have to uh, manually annotate uh, for other ones. And you know, we have to know what those are, and they have to be correct, or the software wouldn't run on the final target. We also do a lot of CVE tracking, so we track CVE metrics for the recipes that we have, and then if there are CVEs that come out, we will patch them. And we also have tools that can make it fairly easy to figure out if a given recipe is vulnerable to CVEs and things like that. We obviously know all the source files. Again, we downloaded the source code, we extracted it, we did whatever with it, so we have a pretty good idea of what those are. And also, you know, the, the files that end up in the individual packages that producing, you know, we put them there, we know what's in them. And uh, something that's a little different about all of this information is that we're very authoritative on this information. Like, we know for sure these are what these things are because we generated them. We're generating them from first principles, uh, which is a little different than perhaps you've seen from some other uh, SBOM related tools where they do uh, scanning of completed images. And not, not to say that that's wrong, it's just it's a different way of doing it. So instead of, you know, we're not scanning things after the fact and trying to heuristically figure out what things are, we're just saying this is what it is because, you know, basically we said so, right? Like this is what we did. Um, and we actually have a, uh, uh, cur currently our policy is that we won't include information in the SPDX if it didn't come from that first principles approach. So we're not planning on adding heuristical scanning tools or anything like that because that's not really our place. Like, we're just saying what we did. So you might see some things in our SBOM stuff that's a little different from what you might see in other SBOMs. Uh, generating SBOMs is very easy. We can generate SBOMs in SPDX JSON format. We chose SPDX uh, as the ISO standard and also Linux Foundation project. It just kind of made sense to do that. And we do JSON because basically all of our build system is written in Python, and JSON with Python is very easy. Uh, so uh, you initialize your build environment uh, right here, just like you would for any other build. You add this single inherit plus equals create SPDX line to your local comp file. You bit bake your image. It will generate SPDX for everything that's in that image and all of the native tools that helped produce that image. So very easy. 
Basically, what this ends up doing is it adds an extra step during the build process at various points where when it does a certain thing, it will then generate an SPDX document that describes the information about what happened during that step of the build. And then at the very end, we take all of those SPDX documents and we put them in a big, big tarball so that you have one file that you can use instead of having to deal with many files. So uh, what features do we have in the SPDX? Uh, most of these are just a repeat of what's in our recipe metadata. Like I said, we have pretty extensive metadata, so you know, it's pretty fairly straightforward to translate that to whatever SPDX field it happens to be. Um, there's a couple things that are worth highlighting. So we, do, we populate the declared license field based on our license uh, metadata that we have. Uh, if a license is not one of the SPDX known license identifiers, it'll actually just include the entire license text because that's super helpful. Um, it makes your SPDX quite large, but at least you still have the license. Uh, again, we can do home page, URL, CVEs, we know all of that. Uh, we can list all the source files with their checksums that, were, that we downloaded and uh, uh, used in order to do the builds. That's very helpful. Uh, we do scan the source files for the SPDX license identifier, and we'll include that information from all the source files that we include in the SBOM. Similarly, with the packages, we know all the files in the packages with their checksums. Uh, we can also do a uh, package file generated from using the debug data. So this is something that's extremely powerful, and basically what it means is we'll look at the debug data, which we always generate uh, unless someone tries really hard to turn it off. When we compile a binary, we, we generate the debug data, and we'll actually look through it and trace back the source code files referenced in the debug data to the original recipes that generated them, which might not be the recipe that you're currently building. Uh, where this becomes super powerful is with when you're including static libraries, because what this allows us to do is trace back binaries that are including static libraries to the recipes that originally produced those static libraries, um, which traditionally is very difficult to do, to know if your binary is using a static library in the first place, and then also to trace it back to the original source. Um, it's not perfect using the debug data, but it's, it's you know, we're, it's pretty good. Um, again, we also have all the build time dependencies and the runtime dependencies, and we can also generate a source code archive if you want to do additional analysis of the source code with Fossology or something like that. Okay, so what can we generate SPDX for? And the short answer is basically anything we can build, we can generate some amount of SPDX for because it just kind of turns on and happens. So all of your on-target, your C, C++, Fortran, your sort of traditional languages, if you want to call it that, uh, we're, you know, we can very easily generate lots of SPDX for that. Again, all those native tools we can generate SPDX for. Uh, we can also, uh, importantly, generate SPDX for the Linux kernel. As far as I know, we are one of the few projects that can generate uh, meaningful SPDX for the Linux kernel. Um, uh, a lot of, uh, some work went into that, and it's really awesome that we can do that. Um, target images, again, anything that we classify as a target image, we can produce SPDX for, um, SDKs, uh, uh, container images, so that's a good one. So if you want to know how do I build a container image where I have SPDX from the build of that container, you can try building it with the Octa project and uh, try that out, so that's really cool. And the same with VM images, right? And I have Rust and Go under construction. Um, Mostly just because the, the core thing that you're trying to build in Rust and Go, like what the recipe is actually written for, uh, we have really good SPDX for that. It's just basically the same as most of the other recipes. Uh, the, the, the part that's missing is Rust and Go have their own package managers. So getting the SPDX from the cargo crates that we pull down is a little more difficult, and I don't think that's working. I didn't actually try it. I should have. but. Uh, uh, so I don't know if that's quite working yet, and the same with Go, right? It pulls in Go modules. I don't know what they're called. Um, it pulls in the Go stuff. I'm not a Rust or Go person, so if you are and you want to figure out how to get this to work so that we can actually get the SPDX from those crates and things, like, you know, that'd be awesome. I would be super excited about that. There's a couple of configuration knobs you can set to control the, basically, amount or style of SPDX output you get. Um, SPDX includes sources as a knob you can turn on and off. So this is what actually includes the list of all the source files 
uh, and their relationships in the generated SPDX document uh, and the license information in them. Uh, it, it's off by default because it's just huge output. Um, the test that I ran, the root file system I generated, uncompressed was 20 megabytes. The SPDX compressed was 23 megabytes. So, you know, more SPDX documentation than the actual thing you produced uh, when you turn this on. So, yeah, it's big. Um, SPDX archive sources, that's the thing that gives you the tarball that has all the sources that you can pass to Fossology or whatever. Similarly, archive packaged will give you the packaged files if you want to do additional analysis on them for some reason. Um, those are both off by default just because they take time. And then the one that I added just last week because I got tired of looking at the uh, a single line of JSON output that we produce to keep the output small is SPDX pretty. That'll give you the nice new lines and indentation if you're manually looking through these things because uh, it can get a little get a little cantankerous after a while. Uh, you can publish your SPDX results on the internet. I'm not going to talk about this. I don't have time. It's there. I will publish my slides after this. All right. So what's actually in our SPDX? Um, yeah, so uh, when you do a build with SPDX, uh, with the create SPDX class enabled, uh, you get some output in your deploy directory. If you're not familiar with the Octo uh, output, don't worry about this too much. Uh, uh, it'll make sense. In typical output, in, in typical, uh, you know, fashion, these are actually sim links to the actual time link, uh, you know, timestamp version files. Uh, you know, I'm just going to pretend they're the actual files because it's just easier. So there's three files that we really care about here. Uh, this first file is the SPDX file for the image itself. So this is the SPDX file that's going to say, this is what went into this image. And basically what it has is a whole bunch of external document references to each package that got installed in that image. The second file, this is the one that you really are most interested in. This is the compressed tarball that contains all the SPDX documents for the image. So it starts with that top level image SPDX document that I was talking about, and then it recursively follows all of the external document references it finds, starting with that file uh, and pulling in those documents and then pulling in the references to those documents until it runs out of things to pull into the tarball. Uh, and that is the compendium of all of the SPDX documents that are relevant for this image. And then this last file is a uh, JSON index file that we create. This isn't an SPDX thing. This is just something we came up with. Uh, so uh, SPDX documents are referenced by their document namespace, which is like a UID-ish type thing. Um, and so that's how you, when we reference one document from another, you, you reference it by that. Um, there, this file lets you easily map the document namespace to the file name um, because our file names aren't named by the document namespace just for reasons. Um, so you can use this if you're trying to transverse the large number of documents that we have to find the file names that you're looking for. So if we do a listing of this uh, SPDX archive, we'll see the files that are in it. We can dig into that and see what's in here. So this is, again, this is that top level uh, image SPDX file that uh, you saw in the previous directory. And this is the index file. It's always the last thing, excuse me, last thing in there. The interesting files are, the, are, uh, are these ones now. So uh, UTL Linux LS block and UTL Linux unshare.spdx.json. These are the SPDX files that describe the packages we produced. So these are going to include the binaries and the files and stuff that got installed onto the uh, image that was produced. And it's going to describe, you know, it's going to have the checksums and all the file listing and all there. Um, due to some uh, quirks in the way that things are generated, we actually have a separate document that describes the runtime relationship between packages, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, so that's in this file. So these files are going to have uh, uh, SPDX relationships that describe how packages run uh, runtime depend on each other. So you can use these to track through the runtime dependencies and figure out like you know, what libraries are being included and whatnot at runtime. And then the final SPDX document is for the actual recipe itself. So, you know, one recipe might produce several packages. In this case, the UTL Linux recipe itself produces the LS block and the unshare packages separately. Um, but they both 
uh, then have a relationship back to the original recipe. So the recipe basically describes the source code um, that's got all your CVE tracking in it. If it's, you know, if you've got that source file listing enabled, it's going to list all of the things. It's got all the licensing information in it. Um, it's basically the things that are common to all of the packages that got produced. Um, so you can think of it like the packages describe what's on the root file system. The recipe describes how those things were built, more or less. All right, so as you might have guessed, we have a lot of relationships in our SPDX documents, uh, a lot of external uh, document reference relationships specifically in our SPDX documents. So this is kind of a chart of what that looks like. Uh, so if we start up here in the upper right corner, that's our, again, our top level image SPDX, and we can track down here, and that contains, right, contains the packages that got installed in that image, um, and so then those packages, again, contain the individual package files that are in them. Uh, and then if we go down from there, we can see that these have a generated from relationship to the recipe that produced them. Uh, and that recipe, again, has this contains relationship on its source code. Um, and also, then, this is how we track the build time dependencies between recipes, right? So build time dependencies are a property of recipes, whereas runtime dependencies are a property of packages. Um, so we go, if we go back up here to our package SPDX, we can see we'll also get these generated from on other recipes, which weren't the ones that produced us, and that's that uh, tracking through the debug source for static libraries and stuff like that. Uh, and then if we move up here, we've got these runtime documents. So as it turns out, <laughs> um, package managers don't require runtime dependencies to be an acyclical graph. Um, it's perfectly acceptable to have cyclical de runtime dependencies. It just means you have to install all of those packages together in one big lump, uh, which is fine. Um, however, when you are referencing SPDX documents, um, you reference them by their document namespace and their checksum, which means once you've written an SPDX document, you can't modify it, um, which is really good for supply chain tracking, um, but it's really bad when you can have circular runtime dependencies because it means you can't put the runtime dependencies in the package because there's not a single node you can start at in the graph that will give you a directed acyclical graph that you can walk through to write out all of your dependencies. So because of that, we actually have to write these runtime dependencies in a separate document so that the package uh, SPDXs that are being referenced have all been written and finalized so that we can reference their checksum. Um, it's just sort of a quirk of the way SPDX uh, currently works. Uh, yeah, so we have these runtime dependencies, and these basically just define the runtime dependencies between two package SPDX documents. They're really not that exciting. They just have a bunch of run runtime dependency of relationships in them. All right, so future things that we'd like to improve with this. Uh, you know, uh, some of this looks a little weird, uh, and I, I won't say that it isn't. Um, I think we're one of the first projects that's really generated this level of SPDX output. Um, and so that's, you know, that's really good. Um, and so we definitely found some edge cases and things in sort of the SPDX spec. And so we're working very closely um, with uh, the SPDX project. And it's, you know, it's good for both of us. Like, it's good that we have a use case that's producing these things and finding them. And that it's good for, that, uh, 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 good for us to uh, help them find these use cases. And, uh, you know, we're going to be able to help them come up with a spec that helps us too. So this is all really good. I'm super excited about that. Uh, we'd really like to be able to pull in SPDX and SBOMs from other upstream source code, particularly like if projects using reuse or something like that. We'd like to be able to pull in their SBOMs. Um, we won't, I, I don't think we would necessarily um, replace what we're producing with that, but we could definitely generate external document references to point to that and pull that into that entire archive. And I think that would work really well because then you can see exactly like, oh, upstream said this, we said this, you know, it's just one more link in that software supply chain, which would be awesome. Uh, we definitely like to include more SPDX fields. We have a whole bunch of information about how we built the, the source code that we aren't currently describing at all. We have, you know, the C flags, the linker flags, all of those things we could include. We could even include, you know, the shell script we actually ran to do the build, you know, crazy stuff like that. Uh, all really useful for supply chain reasons. Okay. so. Uh, moving on to more supply chain related things, we've got reproducible builds. 
So uh, I'm going to talk about how the project can help you have reproducible builds in the things that you build. So uh, why do we need reproducible builds? So uh, there's a bunch of reasons. So uh, we need to be able to know uh, what, like, to be able, in order to be able to resist attack, we need to know if something uh, is worth looking at to see if it's been compromised. And the best way to do that is to have it build reproducibly, because then it's very easy to say, oh, this changed. That shouldn't have happened. Um, if you want to be able to trust your compiler, there's techniques for doing that, like a diverse double compilation. But in order to do that, you need your builds to be reproducible. Um, there's also quality assurance reasons, like the code that, or the things that we're shipping to our customers, we want to be able to reproduce on our desk so that we don't get weird race conditions that only show up in the field and things like that. So we want reproducible builds for that reason. Uh, also, smaller binary differences mean smaller updates if you're doing delta updates. Uh, and uh, increased development speed. You know, if something hasn't changed, it doesn't need to be rebuilt, and that would be awesome. I uh, highly recommend you go check out reproduciblebuilds.org. They have a whole lot of information on reproducible builds. That's awesome. Uh, just from like a project standpoint, uh, we really like the idea of reproducible builds because when we create these task caches, what we're really saying is like we're expecting this output from the recipe, um, and Really, ideally, there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the task cache that we create and the binary output that we generate. So just kind of from an uh, intrinsic project perspective, we really like reproducible builds for that reason, too. So uh, how are we ensuring that builds are reproducible? So uh, the Yocto Auto Builder does uh, regular tests for regressions and reproducible builds. Um, and this is really awesome. Um, you can see the results there uh, on that link if you would like. We're currently testing about 11,000 target packages. We're not currently directly checking the native builds for reproducibility directly. We're sort of indirectly testing them by ensuring that they you know, don't change the target output, obviously. Uh, and we're doing this across the three different package formats that we support, IPK, Debian, and RPM. Uh, we also do this build across multiple build hosts. So We'll do builds on Fedora, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, and then compare the results between them and see if they change. So this is even ensuring that if you switch build hosts, you'll still get the same output uh, there. Uh, and we have tooling in place to do automatic diffoscope output, uh, diffoscope HTML output if we find something that isn't reproducible. So this, it, it, it makes some things very easy to debug. I'm not going to say Diagnosing and debugging reproducibility problems is easy, but you know this can help with some of them. Um, if you want reproducible builds, you do need to test your own. Um, it's you know it's great that Upstream is doing reproducibility testing and making sure that packages are generally reproducible. But if you're not testing it in your actual images, you're not you don't know um, for sure if they're reproducible or not. Fortunately, it's actually quite easy to test this. Um, you can write this three-line Python file right here um, in your own layer and basically just replace this my image with whatever image you want to test for reproducibility and then you can run this command down here uh, and that will run the reproducibility test, go get lunch or go to bed. It takes a really long time. All right, so. Build tools tarball. So this this thing is exciting. So this is this gives you s bombs all the way down. So this is that build tools tarball that I was talking about. So there's actually two different build tools tarball. There's the build tools tarball, which is sort of a minimal set of tools that we use in order to sort of uh, paper over over some of the host differences between builds. And then there's a uh, bigger version of the build tools tarball called build tools tarball extended, which basically includes every host tool that you need to build. So Build Tools Tarball and Build Tools Tarball Extended um, are SDKs. Uh, at the end of the day, they're just SDKs, but they're designed to replace your host tools. Uh, and so if you use the Build Tools Tarball Extended, which is the one I'm going to talk about now, um, you can use it to replace all of your host tools. And what that means is that all the things that I've just talked about with reproducibility and S-bombs and all of that stuff can now apply to that last little bit of host tools that wasn't previously covered, right? So if you do this, you can now trace your target image uh, supply chain all the way back through your target packages to your native tools and cross-compilers and even into your host tools. 
right? If you want to get like really crazy, you could have an air-gapped build host where you go through the, uh, I won't call it not painful effort of building ho build tools tarball extended on that air-gapped host. You could distribute that build tools tarball on your CI and developer systems. They could use that to build all of their stuff. And then um, when they build a final target image, you would be able to trace that all the way back to the RGAP system in your supply chain. Um, so super powerful, really awesome, if you want that really deep supply chain. All right, uh, special thanks to Saul Wald. Uh, I did a lot of the generic uh, SPDX generation support. Uh, he did the stuff that was necessary to make the Linux kernel um, have SPDX support. Uh, which is really awesome. Uh, Ross Burton did a bunch of licensing work to make all our licenses uh, use SPDX identifiers, which is awesome. Andres did the SDK support, which is the thing that allows the build tools tarball to do what it does. And uh, Richard Purdy just does a whole bunch of stuff for the project. And lots of other people have contributed to the project. I, I probably missed a bunch of people, and I'm sorry. I didn't mean to leave anyone out. If you'd like to get involved with what we're doing here, uh, we are on IRC and Matrix, I think. I think it's Matrix. Um, there's a bridge. Uh, uh, you can find us at these channels. There's also a weekly technical meeting that you can attend uh, where we call in and talk about technical pro uh, project stuff. Uh, there's also a weekly bug triage meeting where we go over all the bugs that have been submitted the last week and things like that. Um, there's also an open embedded happy hour, which is the last Wednesday of every month. The next one is next Wednesday. Um, and there is a Yacht Project Summit, which is twice yearly, and I'm sorry I couldn't get a link for that. Um, they didn't really have a generic link yet. All right, questions? Oh, how do we generate SPDX for dynamically generated kernel modules? Dynamically loaded kernel modules. So um, I believe the way that that would work is they're basically treated. Um, so they're going to have a package that gets installed on the root file system. So you're going to get a package as PDX for them. Um, and then you'll be able to trace that back to the recipe. And that recipe should include all the source code for that kernel module. You, you know, a, a lot of the stuff is all just, it's. It's all very similar, right? Like uh, our recipes are all operate. They, they do different things in different steps, but they're kind of all doing very similar things. So um, yeah, I, I, that's how I suspect it will work. I haven't actually tested that. I, I could, but yeah. Any other questions? How much time we got? Two minutes? OK. Sorry, can you say that again? Oh, uh, how, how do you take all of the SPDX output that we generate and distill it for your company lawyer? Um, so like I said, <laughs> we're a fairly early uh, uh, provider of this level of information. Um, and so th the, I th I'm, I'm positive the tooling will catch up with us. Oh, uh, Kate's got. Oh, okay. So apparently you can translate the JSON to spreadsheets, which I, heard, I hear lawyers like. <laughs> um, so you can do that. It, it is a lot of output. And yeah, I think we're a little bit ahead of the tooling at this point. Um, but I'm, I'm positive it'll catch up. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, like I said, we're working very closely with the SPDX project to get some of the tooling. I think, oh, thank you. Yes. Um, yes, this, uh, the question was, when was this released? Um, I know it's, it's definitely in 4.0. Um, 
I should have checked on the timeline. This actually went in like a while ago, so it's probably, huh? I'm sorry, say that again. Yeah, yeah, the, the past release, so the 3.2. I don't remember. I don't know if the pre I don't know if the previous LTS uh, Dunfell 3.1 has it. Um, I'd have to check, but if if it doesn't, the release after it does. It's also um, it's it's not really that complicated. It's just one file, um, so it's potentially something that could be easily backported if if it's not in. Um, like you, you could just, you could probably just copy. If it's not in whatever release you need, you might just be able to copy the BB class to your own layer. Honestly, um, there's really not that much to it. And I see we're done. So, any other questions? Feel free to come talk to me. I could talk about SPDX for probably hours.